Okay, in this video we're going to do an example of parametrizing a curve with respect to arc length. So, you may recall that the formula for arc length, so if you have a vector function r of t with the components f of t, g of t, h of t, t is between a and b, or equivalently you can have it in parametric form, x equals f of t, y is g of t, z um, equals h of t. To get the arc length, and again, you're assuming that the curve is only transverse once, that um, the, the derivatives are all um, continuous, so I'm not writing all those conditions down, but those are part of it. This is the formula for arc length. You just take the derivative of the components, square each of those, add them together, take the square root. That may look familiar um, from the, 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 when you have parametric curves just in the xy plane, right? If it's just uh, in, in 2D, you just have f prime squared plus g prime squared and the square root of that. So it's a very similar formula. Formula We're just now tacking on the extra component squared. So again, um, this video isn't really about coming up with a formula for arc length. Um, I assume you've already seen that, but more about this parameter parametrization, if I can say that correctly. And recall, we can write all this more compactly by the integral from a to b, the magnitude of the derivative of the vector r. Okay, so we're going to define a new function from this that basically is almost doing the exact same thing. This is going to be the arc length function. Okay, and all it is, uh, notice you have basically the exact same formula, except now our variable is going to be t. That's going to be the upper limit of integration here. And all this formula really does is, if you think about this formula, all s of t is going to do is it's going to tell you the distance. So let's suppose, um, so notice if you plug a in, we would have r of a. Suppose this is the vector r of a. And then this is the vector r of t pointing over here on the curve. So there's r of t on the curve. All s of t is, it's still just an r, it's just a length. It's just s of t tells you the length of that section of curve. Okay? But again, we're just making a, a function out of this by setting the upper limit uh, of integration equal to our variable t. So that's all s of t is doing. It's just telling you the length of that curve between r of a and r of t that gets traced out. So what we're going to do with this, and again, we'll talk about this, you know, sort of what it means conceptually a little bit more here. Um, in some cases, it may be possible to solve for t as a function of s, and then we can do a reparametrization by substitution. Okay, so one other comment here, too, because we're going to use the second formula. Recall by the fundamental theorem of calculus, right, the fundamental theorem of calculus basically says if you take the derivative of an integral, so if I take the derivative of the left side, I'm going to have ds dt. If you take the derivative of the integral on the right, remember the way that you evaluate that is you basically just plug in the upper limit of integration if it's a variable. So if you've forgotten about that, you may want to look at the uh, first fundamental theorem of calculus or the fundamental theorem of calculus, whatever part it is. Um, they usually split it into two, but that formula is going to follow. The second formula is going to follow from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so let's do an example here. Where did my example go? There it is. Okay, we're going to reparametrize the helix r of t equals cosine t i plus sine t j plus t k with respect to arc length measured from the point 1, 0, 0. And we're going to do that in the direction of increasing t. Okay, so let's think about this curve real quick. So there's x, y, and z. This curve's not going to be too terribly complicated, so um, notice we're going to start at the point 1, 0, 0. So there's the point 1, uh, 0, 0. Notice as t increases, um, cosine, uh, you've got cosine i and sine tj. Um, as t increases, those are just going to trace out um, a circle, right, in the uh, xy plane. But as t increases, the, the last component is also going to increase. So what you're going to have is just a, um, a spiral that's moving upwards. So let me try to draw my spiral moving upwards. 
Okay, so that's going to be what our curve looks like if you're interested. Okay, so to compute this, all we have to do... The first thing it says we need to compute um, the magnitude of r prime of t. So let's do that first. So there's r of t. So if we take the derivative... So if we take the derivative here, r prime of t... We just take the derivative of each component, so the derivative of cosine will be negative sine. We'll have plus cosine j, cosine t of j, plus 1k. So I'm just taking the derivative of each component. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of 1t is just 1. So recall to get the magnitude of a vector. Um, in this case, all we have to do is we square each component. So negative sine t squared plus cosine t squared plus 1 squared. So we square each component, add them together, and square root. Well, we're going to have sine squared t plus cosine squared t plus 1. But sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, so we have 1 plus 1. So we've got now the square root of 2. All right, so now from this formula, it says the derivative of s with respect to t is equal to that, uh, the magnitude of the derivative. So we know that ds dt equals the square root of 2. So now all we have to do is just a, um, a little bit of, of, of integration here. So again, we have the s or s of t, that's going to be the integral from, okay, so notice we're going to be integrating here um, our lower limit of integration. Notice the point 1 comma 0, 0, that corresponds to the point t equals 0. Okay, and I think that's easiest to see from the last component, right? If the, uh, if the last coordinate's at 0, t's got to equal 0. So our lower limit of integration is going to be 0. And now, again, we're just integrating up to the value of t. Up to the value of t. And we've got our derivative of our vector. But we calculated that value, this uh, derivative. We know that that's equal to square root of 2. Well, if we integrate this here, that's easy enough. We'll just get the square root of 2 from 0 to t. And that's going to be equal to, um, whoops, I almost screwed up here, losing it. So we've got the square root of 2 times u, right? If the antiderivative of square root of 2 with respect to u is going to be the square root of 2 times u from 0 to t. So if we substitute in our upper limit of integration, we have the square root of 2 times t. And if we substitute in the lower limit of integration, we'll just have the square root of 2 times 0. So we're going to be left with the square root of 2 times t. So again, what we have at this point is that s equals the square root of 2 times t. So now all we're going to do is just take this and solve for t. Well, that's easy enough. We can just divide both sides by the square root of 2. And now we're just going to substitute that back into our original our original formula. So the reparametization, we're just going to replace um, t with s over the square root of 2. So so again, now I'm emphasizing I'm writing t of s because t is now a function of s. So we've got cosine of s over the square root of 2 times i plus sine times the or excuse me, sine of s over the square root of 2 multiplied by j. And hopefully I can squeeze this last part in. So t, again, is just going to be s over square root of 2 times k. And we've now uh, done a re-parameterization. Oh, man, I hate that word. I can't get it out. So the only thing that's really, you know, to me, kind of the way I think about it, to go back to my picture, um, again, this is just a vector, you know, pointing off in space somewhere. It's got a certain length and a certain direction. 
the way I think about it is, you know, the original vector was in terms of t. So now all that happens is, you know, for example, if you plugged in t equals 2, maybe you can think about this as time. So t equals 2. So again, you could compute it. I'm going to be lazy and not do it. You'd have cosine of 2 times sine of 2 plus um, 2. So cosine of 2 times i plus sine of 2 times j plus 2 times k. All that's going to do is just going to, you know, it's going to point somewhere on the curve. And it's basically going to tell you where you're at on the curve two seconds later. That's all that this vector is telling you. So two seconds later, it's giving you the coordinates of where the vector is going to be sitting at. The only thing that's different now, now that it's in terms of s, now if you let s equal 2, you know, 2 is going to have to do with length now. So it's going to now point at, you know, once you've traveled two units, so maybe that's one unit and that's two units, now the vector is going to be pointing at the place where you, you've now walked two units along the curve. So that's the only difference. Um, you know, this is pointing at a place after you've walked so many units along the curve. That's what this new vector is doing. Um, the original vector is just telling you where you're going to be sitting at along the curve after so many seconds. So that's the big conceptual difference. Nothing worse than that. So, all right, I'm going to do one more example of this as well. Um, I'm just going to do the mechanics, go through it a little bit faster. So hopefully this example helps. Um, feel free to leave comments as always.